Welcome to XTalks. It's great to have you all here. I'm Molly Ruggles with Residential Education at the Office of Digital Learning, which is part of the Vice President's Office of Open Learning. The VP of Open Learning is here with us today, Dr. Sarma. Um, today we're thrilled to host Professors Wolfgang Ketterle and Professor Lorna Gibson um, for our next talk on digital learning and innovations. So anyway, without further ado, um, the Dean of Digital Learning, Krishna Rajagopal, will moderate the session. And please join me in a warm welcome to Krishna Rajagopal. Thank you, Molly, and thank you all for coming. Um, so I will start by introducing Lorna and Wolfgang a little bit uh, um, uh, each separately, and then I'll introduce um, our topic for today. So Lorna Gibson is the Matula Salapatis Professor of Material Science and Engineering, and she's a professor of mechanical engineering, and she's a McVicker faculty fellow, and she's a former chair of the faculty. Um, she did her undergrad degree in Toronto and her PhD in Cambridge, um, and she is an expert on the mechanical behavior of materials, in particular materials with a cellular structure like honeycombs or foams, which are low weight, um, thermal insulators, shock absorbers used in many engineering applications, biomedical applications, and they're also widespread in nature, from balsa wood to lung alveoli. Um, and somehow along the way, she's become an expert on how woodpeckers avoid brain injury, um, how feathers work. Um, and uh, she teaches 303T, 3032, excuse me, the mechanical behavior materials, and 3054, of course, on cellular solids. And she will be telling us. Um, and what she has been doing um, uh, flipping those classrooms, about which more in a minute. Um, Wolfgang Ketterle is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Physics, Director of the MIT and Harvard Center for Ultracold Atoms, Associate Director of RLE. Um, he um, did his undergrad at TU Munich and his PhD at the University of Munich before finding his way to MIT. Uh, he does experimental research in atomic physics and laser spectroscopy, and he was the first to see, among the first to see Bose-Einstein condensation uh, in 1995, um, and he realized the first atom laser in 1997, and for these accomplishments, he won the Nobel Prize in 2001. Um, what he does now is laser cooling and trapping of neutral atoms to explore new aspects of ultra-cold atomic matter, in particular new kinds of quantum fluids. Um, he teaches 8421 and 8422 core subjects in atomic physics, um, and he also, in that context, has um, experimented with flipping his classroom. So what we are doing today is gathering two from among many faculty at MIT who have um, done what is often called flipping their classrooms, and one of my pet peeves is that term um, because it sounds like it's a binary operation. Your classroom is either this way or that way. There's two states, and that's all there is to it. Um, and I think one of the things I hope that you take away from today's conversation is that there are, in fact, many different ways of blending online and in-person teaching. These are two colleagues who have been doing this in two different ways. Um, different people in different departments with different goals have been doing this differently. And so we're going to hear, um, we'll start with Lorna and then Wolfgang. I've asked each of them to talk for a few minutes about what they have each done. Um, We'll then have a conversation, which I will start among the three of us. And then um, after, after, after a, a little bit, I'll open it up to questions from all of you. But first, we'll give Lorna the floor. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about 3032, which is a course on mechanical behavior of materials that I teach. And this is a required course that our juniors take every fall. I just handed in my greeting on Friday. Um, so um, I've been teaching it in the traditional format for a number of years. And then in 2013, I decided to um, put it online for the MITx and edX for outside students. And so we videotaped the lectures, and we made up online problem sets, and we did little screencast examples. Um, and then the following year, in 2014, I just taught it the same way I always taught it at MIT. So I still did the live lectures. We had written problem sets that the students did. But they had access to all the MITx stuff as well. And they really liked this sort of having all this online uh, information as well. Uh, but some of the students said to me, they said, man, your, your live lectures are almost identical to the videos. And it's partly because I spent a lot of time and effort trying to get the lectures on video really good. And I, you know, I readed the lecture notes. And I, you know, like I, I figured out exactly where I was going to put everything on the board. And so once I'd done that, my lectures were, that was kind of what they were. So the year after that, I decided I would flip it. So the students at MIT were now watching the lectures um, on video 
Uh, they were doing the online problem sets, and I was doing the recitations. So the first year, the way I did it was I did a recitation on Monday, and I did another one on Tuesday. And um, you know, I would go over the main points of each week, and then I would uh, go over the problem set and maybe do one or two examples. And there was more time for questions. Um, this, I think the students found the course, it was OK. And they, they liked the flipped format on the whole. Uh, they liked the instantaneous feedback of the online problem sets. Uh, but I think they thought it was a little too easy. And I think part of the thing is that I find with the online problem sets, because we only grade the final answer, it's difficult to give them something really involved and complex because you know they could have made some arithmetic mistakes somewhere along the way, and, and they get zero because all we grade is the final answer. So this past um, couple of years, what I've been doing is uh, we, we're still flipping the class. They still do the online problem sets, but I'm also giving them a written problem set, which is considerably more challenging. And the written problem set has two questions on it. And um, I have the grader grade them overnight, so they get them back the next day. So they're still, you know, it's not instantaneous, but it's still pretty quick, the, the feedback that they get. Um, and then also, every week, we have a little mini quiz on, on Friday. So at the end of the, the sort of week's topic, we, we have a little mini quiz as well. So they seem to really be liking this. And, and last year, they were, they were very happy with the way it went. And I think they found what they would do is they would do the online problems first, because they knew those were easier ones. And they'd go, oh, OK, I can do this. And they'd get their little green check marks. Um, and then they would try the written ones. And typically, they couldn't do the written ones without coming to the recitation. So that sort of gave them some motivation to come to the recitation. Um, and then I would sort of give them some hints. And we'd talk about the concepts involved. And, and then they would kind of go off and finish the, the written problem set. So that's been working pretty well, I think. The course also has a couple of labs associated with it. And the labs, obviously, are not done online. The, the labs are done in the lab. Um, and they, you know, they find that helpful, too. So the things I think the students like about it are the instantaneous feedback. They like the flexibility of being able to watch the lectures whenever they want. They, they like this combination of online and written problems that are a little more difficult, because they feel, well, there's some that are straightforward, and they kind of start with those, and they kind of see that, oh, yeah, I can do this. And then they try the, the harder ones after that. Uh, the thing I like about it is I really like having the whole um, sort of each week in sync. So you know, when I taught the traditional way, I would lecture Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We would hand out a problem set on Fridays. They would hand it back the following Friday. And we would give them, the, we would grade it, and they would get the solutions the following Friday. So by the time they got the solutions, it was two weeks after I had finished talking about the topic. And by that point, I had already moved on you know, to two more topics. So it was almost kind of out of sync, whereas one of the things with the online um, system that I like is that everything's in sync. In, in one sort of week or week and a half period, they see the lectures, they try the problems, there's the online problems, the written problems, they come to the recitation, we have a little mini quiz, and then we move on the following week to the next topic. So I really like that everything's in sync, and I think having sort of several um, sort of times throughout that week that they have to interact with the material is, is very good, too. So I, I kind of like that. There's a handful of students who don't like it. I would say there's about 35 students take my class every term. And there's probably four or five who kind of wish we had the traditional format. But I'd say the vast majority of them like, like this system. Um, so, so that's kind of how we're running it. Um, Krista mentioned I also have a course on cellular solids, and we flipped that as well. And it runs in a, in a similar way. Um, you know, We have the online lectures. There's, uh, there's an online problem set. Instead of having the written problem sets, they do a project. And so the project, they usually start in the middle of the term, and then they spend the last six weeks of the term working on the project. Um, so it, it's a little bit different in that way. But, but apart from that, it's very similar to the way we run 3032. So I think that gives you sort of a flavor of how I'm running it. Uh, and I, thought, I think that's probably what you want for now. And maybe Wolfgang would like to thank describe you, his course. Thank courses. you, Lorna. So I'll turn it to Wolfgang. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. But let me start out by saying I'm surprised to be here because I'm sitting here on a panel on digital learning. However, I was the person who was teaching in the most old-fashioned way on a blackboard, sort of teaching the classroom in the way how we taught decades ago. Now, how do I eventually wind up here? Well, uh, I started teaching with Ike Schwang, who is you know, an expert in digital learning and such, and he introduced me to tablet computers. So I started not to write on the blackboard, but write on the tablet computer, because 
the, it left it left a record of the class. I could post it immediately after class. I could show the class right up from the last class when I started the next class. So it had certain advantages. I also liked some interactive elements and I used clicker questions early on. Well, my lectures were videotaped for OCW and I thought, oh, that's a good thing. Some people can watch it. It also may be helpful for colleagues who teach atomic physics later on at MIT, they can sort of watch how I did it. And we have a really strong and long tradition in atomic physics of teaching it. And maybe that's a way to continue the tradition. But then eventually, when MIT X came along, Ike Schwang, who is a close friend and close colleague of mine, we have actually taught the course, the atomic physics course together, asked me, hey, should we put it on MIT X? And well, I couldn't resist. I said, well, <laughs> we can do it. And uh, maybe hoping that, well, to improve the videos and such would be an advantage and would maybe provide a better course to people outside MIT. But then, you know, being an MIT professor, I said, but I'm also interested to see how would it work inside MIT. So I got permission from the department while we were having the online course to have to run it residentially with some students. We only wanted a, a small number of students because we didn't want to drain from our normal residential course. So I had six students and they took the online course, but I met with them once a week and had a discussion with them about the material. And that sort of suddenly I realized this can really change the way how I teach. First, all the students liked the new format and Maybe the responses are more mixed in a larger setting, but those six students who took the first beta version uh, of, you can say, the flipped classroom, they all said, we like video lectures better than live lectures. I was shocked. I was trained to be a live <laughs> performer. I thought, this is my job description, to be you know, live in the classroom. And now the students say, a video is better than me. Well, at least it was a video of me. But, uh, but what they told me is, well, they could think about it. They could stop. They could take some notes. They could you know, fit it into their research and watch the lectures when they wanted. So anyway, that was the conclusion. And after that, I felt I could not continue to teach the same way. So what I've done since then is I've taught both parts, 8421, 8422, the first and second semester of the two semester course in atomic physics in the flipped classroom format. I can talk a little bit more about it, what it means for the students and what, I mean, I have feedback questionnaires and all that. But you know, it's sometimes hard to talk about how the students feel because we don't know it firsthand. Let me rather tell you how I felt. <laughs> and I can really say teaching the flipped classroom was for me transformative. I've taught at MIT for more than 20 years. And when I flipped the classroom, I felt very, very different as a teacher in a very positive way. So for me, after 20 years, I thought I've tried out everything. I'm an you know, experienced teacher. No, this experience has completely changed how I'm going to teach in the future. And let me describe how. There were definitely uh, three aspects of it. One is when I, OK, the flipping classroom meant I was just meeting with the students twice a week at the normal class time, but I was not presenting new material. I presented things for discussion in order to deepen the understanding of the material. I actually promised the students, I'm not using this format to squeeze more material into the course. The flipped classroom is only about a deeper understanding. And, and so the transformative experience was for me, I got questions. I've never had so many questions being asked in class. And even after class, then students came to me. I often had to stay half an hour afterwards just to field the questions from the students. Because I explained certain things, maybe perturbation theory in physics, so clearly with all the concepts that the students now felt, now is our chance to really understand it. So they were not just taking notes. They really tried to follow, get a complete understanding. And then naturally, they had questions. Either they wanted to know exactly what I meant with that, or some of the questions of the student immediately took the concepts already to the next level or tried to combine it with the research. 
So these many, many questions really enriched the learning, and it showed me that the students were much more, you know, thinking through the material than just learning it, or it's more about skills and understanding the knowledge. The second thing I noticed, again talking about me, is I've never felt so challenged in the classroom. Because when you come and ask the students, what are your questions? Some students asked me questions which went to the limit or beyond my knowledge. I really felt in the classroom, I wasn't just hiding behind, behind notes. Everything was fair game. And everything I've ever learned as a physicist, suddenly I needed it to explain to the students questions they ask. So they come with came with advanced questions. They wanted to know this or that. And I sometimes felt really challenged. And sometimes I told the students, sorry, I don't know the answer, but I will consult with a colleague. <laughs> and next time I will know the answer. But this also showed the students the process. And finally, I thought I was able, in all these discussions, to show so much more of my personality and how I function as a physicist. OK, the third thing, how I felt this was really transformative for me is, with this flipped classroom, the material is covered by the video lectures. I suddenly had all the time in the world for discussion. When students asked me with something which really went on a tangent, I felt I should just go there. I should react. I should you know, develop the discussion. Or if I realized there was a lack in understanding on the student side, I just completely changed my concept. And we spent half an hour or the whole class on just this one thing. I never got nervous that I wasn't covering anything because the material was covered by the video lectures. So this was for me an amazing change of the classroom atmosphere. And yeah, as I said, for me, there is no way back. I mean, I will continue to teach in this much more interactive way. Maybe I shouldn't talk much longer, but say <laughs> that uh, in terms of student feedback, more than 60% of the students said we like the new format. Uh, I was also experimenting with online homework. Then I changed it and had a combination of online and paper homework. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the class wants a combination of it. Mm -hmm. They like the online homework because of the immediate response, but they feel if we have all the homework online, the questions are too guided, and you can often get away with just guessing the answer or using dimensional analysis and really solving the equations whereas paper homework is a different challenge. And finally, I should just mention one of the, if I would teach it again, um, one of the challenges I would see how to really make the students watch the videos before the discussion section. I asked for an honest feedback, and the student told me that 60% of them usually watched the lectures before the discussion. But I think when the student said usually, that doesn't mean always. 30% <laughs> said they usually watched it afterwards. Mm. And 10% they never watched the video lectures. Mm. And in hindsight, I was a little bit shocked because I feel all the discussion I did when I met with the class was really based on the material in the video lectures. I think I just stop here. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, so I was actually going to ask you, sort of um, keying off of one thing uh, um, which Lorna said and what you said at the end, um, um, to both of you, how do you get students to do the online work before class? And um, how do you get, what did you do specifically to, to, to get the best possible in-class discussion? And sort of Wolfgang has already touched on these. Maybe I'll ask yeah, you to start, yeah. Lorna. So I think, um, I mean, I found the same as you, that some of the students weren't watching the videos. And, and I think that's a bit of an issue. Um, I, I made everything available to the students. So there were the, the lectures, but there were also my lecture notes. There was you know, examples. There was, there was a lot of stuff available to them. Um, and I think another time, I would probably not post the lecture notes until after the problem set was due. And I think that might help them. Like, I think what they really need to do is make their own notes. You know, I really gave them my notes in case they thought something was unclear and they could see what I'd written down. Um, but I think it's actually better if they write their own notes. And I think you learn something. You, know, you have to pay attention more closely if you're going to write it down and make your own notes. And you have to decide, you know, what are you going to put down? What are you not going to put down? Um, 
So I, I kind of feel like there is an issue with trying to get the students to watch the lectures. And you know, I, you know what our students are like. They sort of game the system sometimes. So one student told me, he says, well, what I do is I, I try to do the online problem set first. And if I, can't, if I can't do it just from the lecture notes, then I go back and I watch just that little segment of the video on the lecture that concerns that particular problem, which to me is, you know, it's the whole course. You're taking the whole course. You're not just doing the bits of the course that the problems happen to ask. Um, so, you know, some of them I think really tried to figure out how could they do the problem set with devoting the least possible time to the course, which really, you know, is not very good. Um, so I've been thinking more about how to how to change it a little bit to try to uh, almost force them to, to watch the lecture videos in more detail. And then, as you probably are aware, you can also watch it at one and a half times or two times. Um, and definitely they're doing that as well. So I don't know, I don't know if your students are doing that or not, but, but they, they certainly watch it at faster than speed that I talk. Yeah, I think, so I, I've seen the student surveys in response to um, a different colleague who's, who's not here. Uh, and they, they, in the set of student answers to the survey question, on the one hand, they say they like to watch, talk about Barton Sweebach. They yeah. like to watch Barton Sweebach at one and a half times speed. Yeah. Okay. But then they also say that they love being able to, to, to stop, pause, yes. and go backwards. Yes. Right? Which, yes. Is, which is sort of what you were saying also. So it's yeah. a combination of one and a half times speed when they're following, but going right. backwards when they need to. Yeah, and I think they like that quite a lot. Um, um, so do, do you have any thoughts on how to, well, how, how to um, how, I mean, you said you talked about the great discussions that you had, but how did you manage to accomplish that? Um, and, and it seems to me that it, a necessity is that the students have done the online work before. So if some of them weren't, do you, what, what are your thoughts on how you might? To be honest, I've taught those two classes only once. And especially when we taught the more advanced part, 8422, we were under enormous pressure to get the videos edited and the problem sets up running right before class. So there was not a much of you know, improving the material or iterating the material. I think if I would teach it again, I would, could spend all the time in improving the material. Mm. But... Uh, improving the problems or improving the videos? Or both? More improving the way how we present it and how we would make the students watch the material. I mean, eventually, let me put it this way. This was an advanced graduate course, maybe yeah, different from undergraduate. undergraduate. Yeah. I usually I say the graduate student who come here for PhD are you know, ambitious and they are driven. I don't need to motivate them. I don't have to make them work. Yeah. Uh, I realized that half of the students in my class were not atomic physics students. They did it for Brett's requirement and some were undergraduates and later said, gosh, Maybe I was mainly teaching for the students who do research in this area, and I assume they were self-motivated. But even the highly motivated student, I mean, they have multiple pressures. And let's put it this way. If they take two classes in one class, there is maybe not a weekly deadline. In the other class, there is. I mean, guess mm. what work they prioritize. They would just try to fulfill their deadlines. Yeah. And in my flipped classroom course in my MITx course, uh, we had five modules and I pretty much kept one module open until the end of the module and allowed them to pace themselves and do the problem sets and the concept questions when they wanted. What I should have done is, and what I would probably do in the future, I would kind of put mini deadlines in it. You have to do that part of the problem set until this date, right before we have the discussion. Mm -hmm. Because I think if I leave it open, even the students who are motivated and willing, they are facing multiple pressures from research and, and other classes, and probably a little bit of extra deadline and pressure would help them yeah. to succeed. Yeah, I, I teach, um, the other course I teach, the cellular solids, is one of these joint listed as an undergraduate and graduate subject, and it's also flipped. And I find the graduate students, they do watch the videos, and they're, they're much more sort of dedicated to, to going through everything. So I, I think the graduate students are just more motivated than the undergraduates sometimes. And so how would either of you think differently if you were teaching a sophomore class or, or a junior class in your case, Wolfgang, um, or if you were doing the classes that you've done for the, for the, for the next time? What, what, how would you think, how yeah. would you do things differently? Um, so, so I think, I mean, for me, I think what I would do is not make the lecture notes available until after the problem set was due. So they would, 
you know, they would be able to review it for the, the little weekly quizzes and for the test, but not, not just rely on my notes. They'd have to make their own notes. Um, another thing I've been thinking about doing is, is adding to the written problem sets some concept questions that are, you know, not so numerically focused, but more, you know, explain why this happens on a sort of more fundamental level. Um, because I ask that on the tests, but I don't tend to ask it on the problem sets. And then, you know, on the test, they seem kind of like, oh, like I was supposed to like read the, I was supposed to watch all the lectures and figure this out. So I think I need to ask them actually more concept questions on the tests. And I've been thinking about giving them some little mini take-home experiments. You know, Jeff Grossman in my department teaches 3091 uh, and has these goodie bags where the students have these little experiments. And um, I, we have two labs in the class, so obviously I wouldn't do it for those topics, but if maybe for three or four topics, we could have little weekly take-home experiments where you could you know, push and pull on something and see something happen. Uh, that might be something that would help. Yeah, I think what I would do is, especially for undergraduates, to provide more temporal structure, to sort of have the online material, but then maybe every week have a few questions could be simple questions or concept questions, mm -hmm. and you only get the credit if you finish this segment at a certain date, mm -hmm. which is right before the discussion in class. Yeah. I think this would be helpful. Mm -hmm. It's better if you teach the, the course, you provide a clear temporal structure. Mm -hmm. So let me um, open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, I know this guy has to leave before the end, so I'll start with him. Actually, please please introduce yourself when you get the microphone. Thanks. I'm uh, Sanjay Sarma, uh, uh, ODL. Uh, my question is, what would you say if we, uh, I'm brainstorming here, gamified the video a little bit, and as you're watching the video, there are these little questions that pop up from some point in the video. Hmm. And if you weren't paying attention, you would miss those goodies. Um, you know, because if you just watched, uh, followed video logs, they can just play the video and not watch them. Yeah. But you gamify it, you put a little hook in. I'm, ju I'm just brainstorming, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, because I think the value of your lectures on the videos is great and the students should get it instead of going back and just sampling it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that'd be a nice idea if you could, if you could put something in, you know, in each little segment, that some question and they would have to answer it and they would get some credit for that. I think that would motivate them. They're very motivated by getting credit for things. <laughs> So I apologies to Molly, who's running the mic, but I saw a hand on this side. Uh, so you you went from uh, it's on. Yeah, it's on. so you went from teaching uh, conventional lectures and having everything planned out to almost the minute in your class to coming into class and having in some ways almost nothing planned out and having to improvise in response to your student needs. And I'm wondering if that was a difficult transition or you just felt it was natural, how, how you uh, dealt with that yeah. as an instructor. I think, you, I think you actually did it more than me. Yeah. I, I, do you, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Well, I ne actually, <laughs> when I flipped the classroom, I was working really hard on preparation. I mean, I taught the class multiple times, and it becomes a little bit routine. You have your lecture notes for flipping the classroom. I really prepared. I overlearned the material. I looked through the material and tried to figure out what would be good questions. Where could I ask a seemingly simple question, mm -hmm. which would suddenly make the students think about the concept? So I was actually came very well prepared whenever I came to the classroom discussion, I had a number of topics worked out, but I didn't start with them. I first said, what are your questions? And sometimes I spent half an hour just on questions with the students, but then there were also situations where nobody asked a question. And then this actually resonates what you said, Krishna, that you know, flipping the classroom is not binary. Then I may have talked more than the students, explaining, asking them questions, creating a discussion. So I always had some fallback. I was always prepared. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would, I, similarly, I prepared things. So I, each recitation, I would have like a 15-minute summary of the main points of that week, and I would go over that. And then we would go over the problem sets. So, you know, question by question, I would say, did anybody have any questions with this problem or that problem? And the students did have quite a lot of questions. 
Um, and then I would have a couple of examples that I'd worked out, and I would go through those. And then, you know, sometimes we would finish 10 minutes early, and students would come up and ask me questions. So, so the students were asking way more questions. But it wasn't like I just walked in unprepared. Yes. Yeah. My what? goal is to avoid public humiliation. <laughs> <laughs> One of the lessons for me, at least, I mean, in, in my department, it's um, pretty common, uh, at least at the undergrad level, not at the graduate level, but the undergrad level, to have one faculty member doing the lectures and a different faculty member doing the recitations. And this is like you have the same faculty member doing the lectures and the recitations. And I, I think that the fact that the students are then able to come in and ask the same person whose lectures they just watched questions at this level, that's, I think, part of what opens up the discussion. I mean, I've taught, I've lectured, and I've done recitations. I've never done what um, Wolfgang and Lorna have described. But I, I find that when I'm, um, if I'm teaching recitations, it's, it's, it's perfectly easy to get a discussion going about a problem set question, because the students would like help with doing that problem set question. But it's not so easy to get them to um, do a really engaged discussion of the kind that Wolfgang described. So maybe it's his genius, um, but I think a part of it is that you have, as a student, you have, you are asking the same, per the same person whose lecture you just watched. You have now the opportunity to talk with them. I think that's part of the, mm -hmm. the, the, the added value. Um, th there was a question on this side in the in the back and then the front. Go back first. Um, George Stevens from Physics. So I wanted to make a comment and a question. The comment was, I've always been amazed how few points you need to assign something to get MIT students to do it. <laughs> it's true, it's true. You, you, you cannot assign two, you give one or two points and the participation changes by a huge amount. Uh, the other question regarding the lectures and different learning styles, did you also have, pardon me, textbook readings? Because there may be some of the students, especially students with, you know, sort of better reading English skills than listening, who may have been primarily reading and then coming and asking questions rather than watching the lecture, not because the lectures weren't good, but because for them that was a more useful learning style. Yeah. But the lectures are captioned. They can read if they can't listen. There's full captioning of the, of the video modules. So they can actually read in parallel. And that's part of how they can, how they can watch at two times speed, because they're reading at the same time as they're listening. Yeah. But in response to your question, no, the, for the advanced atomic physics class, there is no adequate textbook. There is some lecture notes in the atomic physics wiki, but there is no, well, they can read up on some material, but there is no text which would allow them to cover the whole material of the lecture. Yeah, and in my class, it sort of combines two different topics. Some of it's solid mechanics, and some of it's why materials have the behavior they have. And so there's, there's books for each of those topics, but there's not really one good book that combines them. So I, you know, I put some books on reserve, and I kind of tell them you can go look at these, but I suspect they mostly rely on the lectures. In the front on this side. Thank you, two questions. My name is Michael Charney. Uh, one is, have you thought of other of, uh, outcome measures? Uh, can you compare previous classes and how many may have gone into the field uh, uh, inspired by uh, the traditional method versus inspired by the new method? Is that an outcome? Final exams? Is there any way to compare and contrast? The second thing is, uh, how does this translate with the size of the class? In the introductory uh, uh, core classes, there are TAs who take the recitation or the, mm -hmm. the special sessions, and one could see a dilution of, of, of the value that you experience, because now you're having graduate students do it. Um, is there a whole other dimension there? Yeah, certainly my department, we tend to have fairly small classes. So my department, typically we have 35 or 40 students in each year. So it works, it works pretty well with those sorts of numbers. But I think, you know, if you had 300 students, it would be a different it would be a different thing. And obviously, one person couldn't do all the recitations for a very large class. You'd have to rely on graduate students or undergraduates to, to help with that. Um, in terms of the outcomes, um, I mean, my sense from you know, the kinds of answers I get from the students on tests is I think they're understanding the material better. Like, they, they don't mis make the same mistakes that they've made in previous years. But I haven't done sort of a quantitative, statistical kind of analysis. And I find. You know, partly because the number of students in the class is small, you know, 
a, a group of students from one year may be different from a group of students from another year. I've only done this, I guess, three times. Um, it's hard to really make you know, strong quantitative comparisons in terms of the outcomes. I would agree. I think somebody like Dave Pritchard with his online assessment tools and standardized tests before or and after the class, he can probably do that for classical mechanics, where also the enrollments are large. But for a small course of 40 people, I think it's impossible to get statistics. On the other hand, I know from the feedback questionnaires that this kind of discussion has made a big difference for some of the students who felt truly inspired. And I know it affected them as scientists to have this discussion format with them. Let me also just say that um, I don't want to divert the conversation from Lorna and Wolfgang, but um, there, are, there are others in the room who have um, blended online online tools within classroom learning in different ways at the large for the large freshman classes. I see Mary Ellen in the back. She could talk about how this is done in some of the large intro biology classes. Um, there are others, I believe, in the room who have, I'm looking for my physics friends, who have certainly been using these tools in different ways in 801 and 802. Uh, but that might be a topic for a different X talk. So let me um, take questions to them, but I'll just flag that there's 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 um, others who could say more. So questions for Lorna and Wolfgang. Hi, I'm Cheryl Barnes in the Office of Digital Learning. Thank you both. Um, it's great to hear your stories. And I'm curious um, whether you've um, talked with your faculty colleagues about your experiences, and if so, what those conversations tend to be like, what, what, what their reaction to your experiences, and in particular, um, if you perceive particular barriers that might somebody, for example, in the Office of Digital Learning might be able to help lower. Mm. Do you want to go first or shall, shall I? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I've talked to my colleagues about the experience and we've shared that, but I don't think any of my colleagues is finding that there is a barrier. It's maybe just a preference how do you want to teach the class? Or there's also the situation if colleagues teach a class for the first time, it's really overwhelming to teach it. Mm. I mean, I would no. to teach it in the online format. I think you first need the experience in a basic class. And online is a bigger challenge. So you need the experience, I think, of conventional teaching before you can bring a class to the online format. Yeah. I think in my department, I mean, quite a number of people have um, put their classes online. And I think it's really just a matter of whether or not the individual faculty member wants to take on the effort to do it. I think everybody sees it's a pretty big effort to do it. So it's really a, a question of whether or not they have the time to do that, the interest to do it. I, I will say these are two departments where faculty have been doing a whole variety of things. We have one person from each department here. But I know because Jessica just gave a talk where she mm -hmm. gave the numbers that in your department, Lorna, yeah. there are seven faculty who have um, done some version of this in nine different classes, you, yeah. being, you being one of the two examples who's done it twice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in physics, um, uh, there's, there's um, um, Ian Stewart's graduate class. So, so Volkan has done it with two different graduate classes. Ian Stewart has done something along these lines with a third graduate class. And then in the undergrad quantum mechanics sequence, Barton Zwiebach all by himself is now working on his third uh, third class, and there, there. What's interesting there is that there have been cases where um, so Barton built the online materials, and now other faculty have um, taught the recitations that have that have partnered with them. Uh, so there, I think. Well, it's up to them to say what their conversations have been, but they are pioneers in their departments, and in their departments, other faculty have been. Um, um, uh, following their lead. Yeah, and I think I find in our department, um, you know, we have a dedicated person, Jess Sandlin, whose job it is is to help faculty do this. And I think without her, we wouldn't be doing it. I think she's really a crucial part of this whole thing. And in physics, that's Safe Ryan, and in biology, it's Mary Ellen Wiltrout, whom I see, mm -hmm. see sitting back there. And there are other. Jen. Where's Jen? There's Jen. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the math department, and there are a few other people with playing similar roles in other in other departments who I haven't. To point out. Your question is actually, uh, let me take it 
I'll answer your question in a different direction when you said, how do you talk to your colleagues about your online experience? Uh, and actually brings me to something really important. I've actually talked a lot to my colleagues about my online experience by actually asking my colleagues the same question I asked the students in discussion. And my colleagues sometimes didn't know the answer. <laughs> so then I went back to the class and said, what we just discussed in <laughs> class, I talked to you know, those and those colleagues. Sometimes I gave the name, sometimes I didn't, and said they were really confused about it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but anyway, so, so, so there was a big, uh, the, the, my class turned into a big con uh, uh, kind of discussion piece. Or, or when I'm invited and give a colloquium and afterwards I sit with colleagues, I sometimes entertain them with questions <laughs> I had prepared for the classroom discussion. That's, that's great. But this brings me to the following. When I thought I would teach an online course or would have, uh, you know, these clicker questions and, 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 and recitation sections and, and flip classroom discussions, I would just take the material and present it in that way. But the new format changes the way how I want to teach. Let me give you th that characteristic example. Before I go into the classroom, I'm really thinking, what is an interesting discussion? And often, I like to use clicker questions, because even in this flipped classroom, it's only 20% of the class who ask questions. There is still a silent minority, a majority. And with a clicker, I can get everybody to answer. So what I've always thought is when I had a discussion, I started it up by giving, asking the students some questions. And I was sometimes with a, you know, devilish pleasure trying to find questions where they would look so simple, but the, the, the intuition <laughs> would fail. And so my favorite histogram was ABC, which is the right answer, 30%, 30%, 30%. Uh. <laughs> because at that moment, mm. the whole class realizes, gosh, as a collective, we don't have any clue. <laughs> and then they listen, because they realize we don't uh. understand that. Yeah. And I found, actually, I got very creative. I thought, what would be a good question which is simple but still not so obvious? And I found such questions. And I realized that many of my experienced colleagues, even including kind of other Nobel laureates, they were not giving the right answer. <laughs> So of course, this is at a high level at a graduate class, and I'm you know, researcher in this area, so I can really think about some subtleties. But yeah. I was saying the new format really made me creative in finding new questions, yeah. distilling out new elements, which often lead to confusion, not just among students, but also among experienced researchers. And then to feature that, this is really enhancing yeah. the learning experience. Ellie. Mechanical engineering. Uh, uh, imagine that you were doing this in some sort of steady state. How often do you think you would want to go back and revideo the lectures? Well, I think it depends on what what kind of course you're lecturing. So the the material I cover in my class is pretty well established. It doesn't change an awful lot. You know, some of it is solid mechanics and beam bending, and you know that hasn't changed for some time. Um, but you know, I think at some point you want to add new topics. Like, oh. so in my class, I, I intersperse the sort of classical things with examples from my research, or like I was saying, I'm a bird watcher. I have birding examples. So you know, bird skulls are lightweight sandwich panels, and I work that into the bit on beam bending. Um, so you know, you might want to work in other sorts of examples or things related to more recent research, and uh, and do that. I haven't got to the stage yet of wanting to re re videotape the lectures. <laughs> Let me also mention before I turn to Wolfgang that there, there is an adiabatic possibility. The, the, the activation energy to, to going and revideoing an entire semester's worth of lectures is pretty high. Um, but now we have the light board. Where, where is Jim? I saw him a minute ago. Um, credit, credit there. We have the light board. So it's, it's now relatively straightforward if you just want to add one 10 minute new chunk or, or three 10 minute new chunks. <coughs> To, to book the light board room, go down with one of your TAs, you can um, flip the switch at the right point, um, and, and at the light board, um, record something that you want to add. And you can then, if you, that could be adding, like what mm -hmm. Lorna said, or it could mm -hmm. be swapping out. Mm -hmm. so, so there is the possibility for adiabatic um, evolution. I think I saw out of the corner of my eye, yes, right here. 
My name is Randall Briggs. I'm a graduate student in mechanical engineering. And one thing I often think about a lot is um, how to motivate students, because I realize that grade motivation can do so much you know, in the short term. And maybe it, maybe it helps them before they have the maturity to realize that the material is inherently important and useful. But I realize that there's a far stronger um, effect when the students are deeply motivated at how powerful and useful a certain material is. When I was an undergraduate, I, um, I struggled for a while, uh, kind of disillusioned, with just problem sets, doing the, the mathematics, the homework, and turning it in in this continuous cycle. And so I, my grades slipped. I had to leave MIT for a while. But working at a high-speed centrifuge company, everything was applicable all of a mm. sudden. And I could build these amazing million-dollar machines and use all the tools I had learned in undergrad. And um, so coming back, I was totally different. But ever since then, I've always thought about, like, it feels to me almost that it's the burden on the professors in an ideal world to impart a deep motivation that will last for a lifetime and, and uh, give the students the, the, willing, the inherent willingness to, to lear learn the material. And anyway, yeah, so that they, they, they have a lot of inner strength if, if they want to do something. And I'm just curious how, in the new format, is there any benefit yes. to imp imparting motivation? Yeah, I don't know. I think mostly the motivation is through the lectures and what I cover in the lecture topics. And, you know, I think part of it is, you know, I cover some basic stuff, but then I also talk about how it relates to things in my research. Um, I also tell stories in the, in the class, too. Some of them are just little historical things. Sometimes we talk about engineering failures, and they kind of see, oh, you know, this, this ship cracked in two because of some fracture mechanics issue. So I try to have some things at the beginning of each topic that kind of get them interested in the topic. And then sort of as I go through it, I, I try to have other, other sort of little stories that I tell them. Um, so I, th I think that's how I try to do it. But you know, some people are always going to be more motivated than others. It's, it's a hard thing to get everybody motivated. But. I think some students in my class got motivated by the personal experience. And maybe what I think got them excited, and some of them said this was a fantastic class, was really went pretty much overboard in expressing how much they liked the class and how special it was to them. Because I think I showed a lot of personality. I engaged in discussions. I talked about my understanding, how I do science, how I think about, you know, how I interpret equations, how I think about quantum mechanics. So in the end, what I did is I gave them deep insight into my personality as a scientist. And I think this clicked yeah. with a number of students. Yeah. So let me ask a question. Um, so I'll quote your department head, Chris Shu. At, at, at one point, um, right around the time I was taking on this new, this, this role as Dean for Digital Learning, knowing how much your department has done in this space, I asked Chris, um, in effect, why, you know, why are you doing this? Um, what, what are your, what are your department, mm -hmm. at the departmental level, the motivation? And um, half of the answer was, from him was about exactly what, what we've been talking about here, the motivations for um, exploring um, better ways of teaching our students here at MIT. But the other half um, for him was the outward facing motivation. And what he said to me was material science is a relatively young discipline. I think our department has a particularly good way of defining what the discipline is and how it should be taught. And I want us as a department to put our stamp on our discipline. Mm -hmm. okay, that's what Chris said to me. Mm -hmm. Now, now it's too much to ask one professor with one class to put a stamp on an entire discipline, but I wanted to ask you to take a, take each take a turn at talking about the outward impact. Yeah. So each of you, for 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 mechanics, for mecha materials in your case, for atomic physics, has had the opportunity to use the outside world is not everything we've just talked about here. The outside world isn't getting, right? They're not getting the mm -hmm. the, the, the engaged mm -hmm. discussion. They're they're not getting the things that our students are getting, but what they are getting is the segmented video lectures. You know they are they are getting. So how how do you see how you've been able to put not the MIT physics but the Wolfgang Ketterle stamp on atom, what atomic physics is and how it should be taught? The Lorna Gibson stamp on what you're teaching how it should be taught. Yeah. So if you just I say think a little, you know a I think bit about that. Chris Shu, my department head, and I think a number of my colleagues feel that that this is sort of the modern version of doing a textbook. You know it used to be that faculty wrote textbooks. And that you know the department might aspire to to develop a series of textbooks written by various faculty that would define some part of the field, and I think Chris and and some of my colleagues feel that this online learning is a sort of similar thing. So I found it kind of amazing that the number of people who've taken the course outside of MIT and the response that I've gotten. So. Um, 
you know, there's been people all over the world have taken it. You know, as, a, as an instructor, you can see what countries people are from and, and uh, what their background is, what their sort of previous education is, that kind of stuff. So I've been stunned at how many people have actually taken it. And, you know, I find pretty regularly I have visitors come to my office, you know, faculty from other universities, and they say, oh, you know, I had a graduate student and, and they didn't really have quite the background to do, you know, what I wanted them to do. Like often, I, I do a lot of work on biomechanics, so I interact a lot with biologists. Uh, so sometimes I'll get a, a biologist colleague come, and you know, the, the, their students typically don't have the mechanics background. And they say, my student took your course online, and it was really helpful for them to do their biomechanics research. Um, so there's, there's been lots of uh, comments like that. I've had people just, like I went into Legal Seafoods for dinner one night, and somebody <laughs> kind of grabbed me and said, you're a Professor Gibson. I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I took your course. <laughs> it's like a total stranger. <laughs> so, so I found um, you know, the numbers of people who've taken it have, has been impressive to me. Um, but also, you know, I, having colleagues tell me that their students have used it and found it very helpful, I found it very gratifying. Um, well, it also happens to me that when I visit other universities that graduate students come up to me and said, oh, I really enjoyed yeah. your lectures. Yeah. Also, they are at places where, you know, they have good lectures in atomic physics and quantum mechanics and all that, but they make a point in expressing to me that they felt my lectures were special and, and they benefited from them. So in that sense, yes, I'm proud that maybe the special selection of topics, which is a tradition here at MIT, based on Dan Kleppner, Dave Pritchard, and, uh, and we have a long tradition here, that, <laughs> that some of this spirit can now be shared with the rest of the world, with outside MIT. On the other hand, I have to say, it would be hard for me to focus on what do, what, what do I want to bring to the world outside. I think I'm 100% no. busy in saying, what is the best education for MIT students, yeah. and then share this these developments with the rest of the world. So it's a nice byproduct. It's more a byproduct because mm. I feel I'm committed to MIT and the residential students. I will just say, I mean, data gathering on this is, is maybe um, uh, a little hard, but um, one thing which um, Lydia Snover just did um, for us, of, of the 4,000 MIT undergrads, roughly 1,000 said they, they had taken at least one MITx course before they came here. Mm. Uh, and I suspect that at the graduate student level, the new PhD students coming in, um, although it's a little harder to get the data, but I, I think at the new PhD student level, that, that fraction is going to rise. So in thinking about the, the impact for us at MIT, I think part of the impact of what you do is it will, it will factor into us attracting the best people to come here in decades to come. Mm -hmm. um, what, where are we supposed to be on time, Molly? Well, we officially go to 4.15. Okay, so I can take a few more questions. Uh, there and then there. Okay, so who, this gentleman over here? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Gary Roberts, uh, Sloan School. And uh, my question is, uh, we're focusing on flipped classes, and the innovation that we've been just exploring the most is uh, video capture, maybe some online assessments. Are there other innovations beyond the lecture capture that um, you've used or are familiar with or are intrigued by uh, deploying the, the technology, online technologies? Um, well, I guess, I mean, one of the things I've done that I didn't really talk about is I've done some little sort of mini documentary type things that aren't typical lectures. So um, I teach mechanics. One of the very first thing we do is called Hooke's Law. You know, you take a spring, you pull on the spring, if you twice the force, you get twice the extension. People take that in high school physics. That's kind of the basic basis of a lot of the stuff that I teach in mechanics. And uh, engineers all know this guy because of Hooke's Law. Um, biologists all know him because he wrote a book called Micrographia. He got one of the first early microscopes in the 1600s, and he put lots of different things through, and he was an artist as well as an engineer and scientist, and he made beautiful drawings. And he had a like, little one, two-page description of each thing. And I feel like the engineering students need to know about Robert Hooke. And I used to show a little video that the Bodleian Library at Oxford had of a historian of science, and he had a first edition, and it was open to his drawing of the flea. And I, I mentioned this to a friend of mine who works at the Harvard Libraries. And she instantly said, oh, 
I bet we have a first edition. <laughs> it turns out they have like four or five first editions. <laughs> and she said, I could arrange for you to make a video about Hooke's micrographia. So, so we went up to the Botany Library at Harvard, and we, we did this little video, and I talked about the role of that book in the history of material science. And the, you know, material science is largely about looking at the structure of materials on atomic scale or, or other scales, microscopic scales, um, and then relating the properties to that structure. And Robert Hooke's book is the first one that really talks about that. So it, it's still sort of a lectury type thing, but it's, it's something that I could never have done in class. I couldn't take my class to the Botany Library and see this book. Uh, but my class gets to see this little 10 minute video of me talking about the role of that book um, in, the, in the history of, of my department, my field. So it's kind of a nice little thing that we did, which was really made possible by MITx. So I'll turn to Wolfgang in a second, but let me just say um, the, the, the other, in addition to, to lecture capture, the other thing is assessments. And, and all throughout the Office of Digital Learning, there are people who are trying to push towards more complex assessments in different senses, and it might mean different things in different disciplines. Certainly, um, certainly in physics, the, what Wolfgang and Ike pioneered, um, he, he said that they were not able to do the most complex questions they wanted to do. But for, for, the, for the sophomore and junior level quantum mechanics, the fact that they did all that they did made it much easier to do what the professor wanted to do there. Um, I see Jen French sitting there, and, and she has helped to develop a, um, an online tool that allows the online learners to draw a graph, and for that, mm. the, the graph that they draw to be to be assessed um, by the by the platform, you know, within the platform. Um, uh, let me not try and, and come up with other examples. There are examples in biology, which Mary Ellen could say more about. So, so I think in in thinking about what people are trying to to push that goes beyond video capture. Um, a big part of that is, is assessments, um, and different people are doing this in different ways. I'll, I'll just say my, my analog of the hook story is, so I'm, I'm um, one of the minions in 802X. Um, I'm, I'm recording some lectures. 802X is an online um, 802, which is being, being developed in my department. I'm doing some of the lectures, and I'm doing what I'm told. Um, um, Michelle Tomasic is telling me what to do. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the things that I insisted on adding was telling a story, um, like Lorna, I, I told the story of Peter Higgs um, because uh, there's a sense in which Maxwell, so 802 is about Maxwell's equation, there's a sense in which Peter Higgs completed something which Maxwell began. Um, what's now called the standard model of physics, the earliest piece of it to be discovered was Maxwell's equations. Um, and, and, and Peter Higgs, in a sense, completed it. So I tell that story. And then how was Higgs' uh, insight verified? Well, it was the Large Hadron Collider, which is that's Maxwell's equations on steroids. It's, it's electric and magnetic fields in the service of, of checking Higgs's theory. So I, so I, I made my version of Hooke was, was, was Peter Higgs. So this is the kind of thing once you, I, I think other people have this, the idea of, of um, adding a little story. And part of, part of it is I think there's no reason you can't do that in the classroom. Um, but if you, if you do it as a little separate video and you call it a, um, um, if, you, if you call it something that connotes that it's, that's a little, just a little bit of a, of a little story on the side, um, you somehow feel more willing to do it at, than, than you would because in the classroom you feel like I have 90 minutes and if I'm going to take 15 to really tell this story well, oh my goodness, what did I just leave out? And, and you don't feel like that when you're, when, you're, mm. when you're doing it online. But Wolfgang. Well, when you ask what kind of developments other than video capture, I, I would agree online problems is actually quite a challenge. Namely, the more advanced the course is, how can you ask complicated questions mm -hmm. and still have an online format? And as I said, uh, I mean, uh, we, and that's mainly Ike Schwang, who actually developed and, and coded actually many of the online questions. It's really sort of the challenge. How can you ask something which is still general enough that the students think about it or even have to go through a derivation and not just guess a sort of multiple choice answer. This is, it's sort of difficult. Mm. And I think it's an open challenge, an ongoing challenge. And I think as Krishna mentioned, we have really developed more and more tools which almost allow the impossible to ask a rich question with a rich variety of answers but still program software to, that students can enter it and then it can be evaluated. Question here. 
Alex Prangle, ISNT. Uh, when I used to be a teacher a long, long time ago, before the days of video lectures, uh, one of the things I really appreciated when I was lecturing was the ability to interact directly with students. For one thing, I could find out where they were losing it a little bit. Uh, in some cases, I could actually course correct the lecture in real time. And I would find, if I were teaching today, that I'd really miss that. Um, I know that you can have recitation sections, and you can have them ask lots and lots of things in those. But they're probably at least a day after the video lecture, and maybe more. And I personally feel that you would, I would lose something in terms of be able, being able to interact in real time. Uh, now, one of the things about my classes is that there were typically 30 or less. So these weren't big, huge 300 student classes. And the other thing I realized is that when you do things this way, you have to be a little bit controlling of how many questions come in, because it's very easy to have your lecture turn into an extended recitation. But I still think that that interactivity was very valuable to me. And I wonder how you feel about that in the day of video lectures. Yeah. I mean, the thing I find is they, they did ask some questions during the lecture, but just not very many. Yeah. And I'd say half of the questions were like, oh, you forgot a factor of x here. So they were just like little you know, technical glitches that I f was forgetful about something. There weren't that many really deep, meaningful questions. I mean, occasionally they were. Um, but I, I often felt in the lecture I had to give a very cursory kind of response. And I actually feel in the recitation I have more time to give more detailed and in-depth responses. Yeah, I think in the flipped classroom format, you get many more questions and you have many more opportunities to interact with the class in an interactive way. I would actually say that faculty time for just conveying knowledge is maybe wasted because knowledge can be obtained by watching lectures, reading textbooks, but then the interaction face to face with faculty is really needed to understand the material, to have a discussion from different perspectives, sort of take the knowledge to a higher level where it's deep understanding. Yeah, I think the other thing I found was in the lecture, you know, I might have 35, 40 students in the class, and it was always the same three or four students who were asking the questions. And I think they kind of felt comfortable asking questions in lecture. But now that I do the recitations, there's far more of the students ask me questions. And I think they kind of feel, well, this is a recitation. This is what it's for. And I think they feel more comfortable asking questions. And you don't feel that the time delay is an issue between maybe well, they were confused when they watched the lecture, but then a day later they don't remember? It's not that big of a time delay. You know, typically we. They watch the lectures over the over the weekend. I think like typically the, the little mini quiz on the previous week is on a Friday. I think they watch the lectures on the weekend and try to do the problem sets. And I do the recitation on Monday. So, you know, I think they can retain the question and bring it to class. Let me also add that this uh, it is important after you've had the discussions that when you go back to to do this again the next year that you can improve things. Mm. And so that's why the adiabatic process of improvement I mentioned is important. Um, the other thing I will say, just it, it's not a direct answer to your question, but um, I think they've answered your question. But uh, I don't know if either of you did this, but when Barton Swebach taught um, 805, uh, when he developed the um, online version of 805, what he did, and I don't know if others of you have done this, but he had um, he, he had it running, um, hit it running for a cohort of 20 MIT students, much in the mode that you're describing, about a week to 10 days ahead of running it for uh, the outside world. So he was actually, he actually had the ability to, um, so he had the online lectures and then he would have the discussion with the students and then he had a, then he had a week to make changes before the rest of the world saw mm. it. Um, uh, so anyway, it, like with anything you do, you always need to iterate. Um, and, and I think part of what we're hearing from them is that um, the, the, this is a way on campus of engaging the students more, not less. And then a challenge that I want to ask from the Office of Student Learning is how to, how to use that to the benefit of the, the, the outward facing product also. Um, but anyway, I think I haven't been looking this way. Or maybe in response to your question, I would say, if you imagine, would it be the best of two worlds to have live lectures and then live 
classroom discussions, but I would say in principle, yes, but in practice, the students would say that's just too much, much. face time. Yeah. So it's for me, either you meet twice a week for lectures, live lectures, or you can meet twice a week for the flipped classroom. And it's definitely in the latter where you connect much more to the students and you receive much, many, many more questions. Noriel, did you have a question back there? Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to end in a slightly personal way by thanking you by saying that um, you know, sometime over the past summer, Sanjay, who is no longer sitting there, um, um, Sanjay, you know, came after me and, and asked me to be dean for digital learning. Um, why did I take the job? Um, a big part of why I took the job is because I, I deeply believe that we can use these, these tools to improve how we teach our students on campus. Now, why did I believe that? I think a big reason why I believe that is because I could see what you were doing and I could see what you were doing. Mm, thank you. Um, and, and it's, it, it's fine to talk about it, um, and that's what we were doing here, but I encourage you to actually you know, go and watch their, anyway, see, seeing what they were doing is, was, was, was important to me to, to realizing what can be done. So I want to thank you for all that you're doing and for talking about it today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.